All right. So you may have noticed, uh, it's been a while since I, we've been going through the book of Revelation, as I think most of you know, and it's been a while. So I went ahead and put these out again, which is just a, an outline of the book of Revelation. It's not one that I wrote. Some of the language they use, I wouldn't necessarily have used, but I'm too lazy to make my own chart. So this is, uh, I just find things online and print them out. And not my sermons, but the charts, just to be clear. <laughs> I have never done that, and I never will. Um, so it just, that's just to give you some sense of the overview. And where we're at today is, uh, if you look uh, there between 16 and 18, um, well, actually, <clears throat> we're going to be at the end of chapter 14, chapter 15, and hopefully we'll get to chapter 16. I'm kind of going to go through this at the speed of light, I hope. Uh, but we're getting very close to the seven bowls of judgment, which are the last, uh, the last group of seven uh, judgments of God upon the earth. And, uh, you know, we're actually going to be done with the book of Revelation fairly quick um, uh, because the, the chapters uh, 17, 18, and most of 19 are actually a, a, a long, extended sort of um, lament and judgment upon Babylon, which, of course, isn't actually Babylon, and we'll get to that in a minute. But that's, basically, that's going to be one sermon for me, so 17, 18, and 19, because there's a lot of repetition, and there's a lot of things that don't really need to be gone over and over and over again. And so we're actually going to be getting very quickly to Revelation chapter uh, 20 and 21, 22, and then, you know, we're done. That's uh, the end. So uh, we're not going to be in Revelation for that much longer. Um, and the end, of course, is the most enjoyable one to preach on. Uh, you have to, to wade through the, the, the blood and the mud, if you will, uh, to get to, to the light, um, much like with life. Okay, so... Um, we're just going to, I'm going to jump in. I'm gonna be doing a lot of reading and I'm just going to trust that Elizabeth is going to follow me on the, on the scripture. And I'm not going to be looking back there. So if there's any trouble or you're lost, uh, just say Seth. Yeah. And I will do something. Uh, so we're going to start in chapter 14. If you're following along in your Bibles, we're at Revelation chapter 14, starting in verse 14. I had to look and check exactly where I left off last. I had no idea what I, I was saying when I, before I left on, on my uh, trip. Okay. I looked, and there before me was a white cloud, and seated on the cloud was one like a son of man, with a crown of gold on his head, and a sharp sickle in his hand. So this end of chapter 14, I'm not going to go back and recap what happened in, in chapter 14, but this is sort of a parenthetical. This is just a vision that John has that isn't really related to the narrative that's going forward, okay? This is just a, you know, sometimes he has these visions that just break into the narrative. Remember, he had the vision about the woman and the dragon, and it wasn't really part of what was going on. It was just a, a vision about the people of, of uh, about the Israelites, about the Jewish people. This is like that. So this is a sort of a separate vision. Uh, seated on a cloud was one like a son of man, so Jesus, with a crown of gold on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. Then another angel came out of the temple and called in a loud voice to him who was sitting on the cloud, take your sickle and reap, because the time to reap has come, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he who was seated on the cloud swung his sickle over the earth, and the earth was harvested. Another angel came out of the temple in heaven, and he too had a sharp sickle. And still another angel who had charge of the fire, remember the, the fire is in the center of the altar of the temple, and that's where uh, um, offerings to God were burnt up, consumed, sin offerings, right? were destroyed there in, in, in the altar. So he was in charge of the fire, uh, came from the altar and called in a loud voice to him who had the sharp sickle. So the, the angel who's in charge of the, the fire sacrifice is calling to the angel with the sickle, take your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of grapes from the earth's vine because its grapes are ripe. The angel swung his sickle on the earth, gathered its grapes and threw them into the great wine press of God's wrath. And they were trampled in the wine press outside the city, and blood flowed out of the press, rising as high as the horse's bridles for a distance of 1,600 stadia, which for what it's worth is roughly 180 miles. So, so this is just this image that John sees, this, this, this vision of, of, of and it's, it's in, uh, Jesus talks about it in his teachings in the Gospels as well, of, you know, uh, don't, he tells us basically not to harvest, right? 
He says, you know, you can't discern the wheats from the tares. You, you don't have that kind of wisdom. I will harvest when the time comes. And this is a, a symbolic uh, description. I mean, Jesus isn't literally sitting on a cloud with a sickle. I mean, these are, I hope you understand, again, these are symbols, but of Jesus' judgment being the only one in true judgment. And so he, uh, Jesus is described here as harvesting. And, you know, harvesting is generally a positive, you know, it brings food in abundance. And it's, it's, it's a good thing. You know, this is an image of Jesus taking those who are his to himself, right? And then this angel comes out of, uh, and it's related to judgment. We know that because of the fire and the altar. And these two angels rather come out and it's their time to harvest as well, except they're harvesting in this instance, the images of grapes, so a different kind of crop than what Jesus was harvesting. And it gets very, the symbolism becomes uh, uh, quite uh, gruesome, if you will, because the, the, the grapes are, are tramped down outside the city, which is a symbol of being outside of God's grace and protection and, uh, you, you know, a place of, of danger. And just like Jesus was crucified outside the city, right? You know, it's, it's the same sort of idea. And what comes out is blood. And how much blood? Well, a river, a river of blood. And this is a, just another example of, you remember how it, we had the unholy trinity? The dragon is Satan and the two beasts, uh, one beast symbolizing the Antichrist, the anti-Jesus. The other beast was the anti-Holy Spirit. So you have this unholy trinity whose number is 666. Well, there's all these mirror images in, in these visions. And so just like if you'll remember, you won't, well, at the end of the book of Revelation, as I'm sure many of you have read before, in the New Jerusalem, there's a river of life flowing out from the city, right? And, and, and the river of life gives, gives life to the trees that are alongside the river and the, the leaves of the trees are for the healing of the nations. It's this beautiful image of this, of this life-giving uh, river that, that heals us. And the, the, uh, the, the negative of that, the, the, the image is, is this, a river of blood of judgment coming out from this wine press. And so that this is, these are just, you know, there's just another image of salvation versus damnation, if you will. Okay. And this is also, for what it's worth, it's where we get uh, the, the Steinbeck got his term grapes of wrath from, for his novel. Actually, he got it from the hymn, the battle hymn of the Republic. Uh, Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. Um, something about grapes. With the with grapes. That's right. Yeah, you all sang it more or less. <laughs> I just blanked out on it. Um, and so his wife, um, so Steinbeck was having a hard time coming up with a title for his novel. And it was his wife who suggested using that phrase from the song, Grapes of Wrath, and he liked it. And so there you have it. It's not really related to anything. I thought that was an interesting bit of American trivia, but that's where we get this image from of the Grapes of Wrath. Um, although interesting, it's not in the song, it's Jesus who's trampling out the, in, in, in the scripture, it's actually an angel. Not that it really matters that much, but just a little side. Point. Okay, so now we're in chapter 15. And we're into um, the last seven. Remember, we've had seven seals. Well, just to recap, Jesus opens up the scroll. He's the only one worthy to open the scroll. And so he opens up the scroll in heaven, right? And we, we have these seven seals that are unsealed. And then we have these seven trumpets. And then we have here these uh, seven bowls that are poured out. And these seven bowls are the last of God's wrath upon the land. And start, oh, sorry, sorry, start, starting in here in chapter 15. I saw in heaven another great and marvelous sign, seven angels with the seven last plagues, last because with them God's wrath is completed. And I saw what looked like a sea of glass glowing with fire, and standing beside the sea, those who had been victorious over the beast and its image and over the number of its name. What's that mean, people who are victorious over the beast and its image and over the number of its name? It means those who were killed. Remember that the beast, uh, that, that the Antichrist is killing people who will not bend the knee uh, to him. Uh, they held harps given them by God and sang the song of God's servant Moses and of the Lamb. And we've seen over and over again this image of in, in the throne room of God, these beautiful images of, of angels and, and humans singing these songs of worship and praise while God's wrath falls upon the earth. Um, so they sang the song of God's servant Moses and of the Lamb. Great and marvelous are your deeds, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, King of the nations. Who will not fear you, Lord, 
and bring glory to your name. For you alone are holy. All the nations will come and worship before you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. After this, I looked and I saw in heaven the temple, that is the tabernacle of the covenant law, it's very specific, and it was opened. Out of the temple came the seven angels with the seven plagues. They were dressed in clean, shining linen and wore golden sashes around their chests. You know, um, one thing that occurs to me with this image, uh, there are terrible things happening in the book of Revelation with regard to humans on earth and, and, and uh, uh, you know, the beast bringing uh, persecution to, to Christians all over the world. But the judgment that people are experiencing is not from Satan. The judgment of God is from God. And these angels who are coming out are not depicted as uh, hideous beasts or dragons of, who, who, who breathe out fire. You know, they're, they're cleanly dressed with golden sashes. You know, their, their judgment is pure, is what is, is the sense that is true. It's not, it's not out of a sense of just capricious anger or, or some sort of a jealousy. It's, it's, a, it's a just judgment of God, and they're dressed accordingly. Then one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls filled with the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no one could enter the temple until the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed. It's an interesting term, sentence there that no one could enter the temple until this wrath was poured out. Well, who's entering the temple? As I've mentioned before, throughout the book of the Revelation, the space between heaven and earth becomes uh, closer and closer. And as we get towards the end of Revelation, it kind of becomes hard to tell whether we're talking about what's happening on earth or on, in heaven. And indeed, it says very specifically in, uh, in the new heavens, and the new earth, there is no temple. It's explicitly said there's no temple. There's no need for a temple. Why would there be? Uh, everything is basically worship at that point. And, and uh, but it says here that no one enters the temple until the seven, uh, until the, the, the wrath is completed. And uh, so stick a pin in that because we'll get to that in uh, Revelation 19 or early in 20 about what that means or, or why that is. Where was it? Yeah. Okay. So now uh, we are actually in, in chapter 16, and this is the, these are the this is the judgment of God coming. Okay. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, go pour out the seven bowls of God's wrath on the earth. And you'll see a lot of similarities here, if you remember, from the trumpets. Uh, and I'll talk about that after I read through them. The first angel went and poured out his bowl on the land, and ugly, festering sores broke out on the people who had the mark of the beast and worshipped its image. Actually, you know what? I'll talk about it now, because I think as I read it, it'll be helpful. With the seven seals and the seven trumpets and the seven bowls, there's a progression. And I'm not gonna, I can't, I don't have the time to go through and go through it all. You can look at it later if you wish, but you'll notice that the seven seals uh, are sort of a general, they're very general, like disease goes out into the world, war goes out into the world. You know, it's, it's a sort of a generalized sense of God's judgment uh, upon the earth. And as such, some people interpret the seven seals as just being. Uh, the unbreaking of those is just being life as we know it. Uh, I don't personally, but it's a viable interpretation. Uh, I understand why some people do. The seven trumpets gets, uh, and also the seven seals affects everybody, typically, um, the whole world. You know, it's not just the people who are worshiping the beast. In, in fact, it predates the, the beast uh, narrative. The seven trumpets, well, it's a bit different. Some of the trumpets that are blown affect the whole world. Uh, waters turning to blood or these ecological disasters and such that everybody suffers. Some are specifically marked for people who worship the beast, their judgments upon people who are worshiping Satan. Um, so it's kind of a, kind of a mix as, as it were. Um, and, and often it's, it's not as, uh, it's not as comprehensive. So it'll say something like, you know, a third of the waters turn bitter. A, a third of this did that. I think uh, uh, several trumpets have a third of such, a third of this, a third of that. And here at the last one, the seven bowls of God's wrath, it's almost, it's specifically each time targeting people who do not know the Lord. So it's, it's focused in on people who are still refusing to worship God, which makes some sense, because probably at this time in the narrative, 
there aren't many people left on earth who worship the Lord. They're mostly passed away, either through persecution or through these terrible events that are coming. They're almost all gone. And in fact, that makes sense because Jesus himself says, which I wish I'd written it down, but I think it was in Matthew 24, I believe. Um, he says, you know, that those days, the final days are cut short for the sake of the elect or otherwise no one would survive. When he talks about how dreadful it would be for everyone in, in, in the tribulation, in the final days, he says, luckily those days are cut short or no one would survive. So there's very few people of faith left on the earth. And the image of these, these curses that are being poured out here are comprehensive. There's, it's not a third of this or a third of that. It's just everything. So the first angel went and poured out his bowl on the land and ugly festering sores broke out on the people who had the mark of the beast and worshiped its image. The second angel poured out his bowl on the sea and it turned into blood like that of a dead person and every living thing in the sea died. Again, in, in the trumpet scenario, I think it was a third of the things in the sea died or something of that nature. The third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and springs of water and they became blood. And I heard the angel in charge of the waters say, you are just in these judgments, O holy one. You who are and who were, for they have shed the blood of your holy people and your prophets, and you have given them blood to drink as they deserve. And I heard the altar respond, the altar in the temple. Yes, Lord God Almighty, true and just are your judgments. The fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and the sun was allowed to scorch people with fire. They were seared by the intense heat. And they cursed the name of God who had control over these plagues, but they refused to repent and glorify him. So there's this, you can see this hardening, it's very like a Pharaoh kind of situation. As people, the more God pours out his wrath, there are people are hardening their hearts against him. The fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast and its kingdom was plunged into darkness. People gnawed their tongues in agony, cursed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, but they refused to repent of what they had done. The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates. Now this gets very specific. And its water was dried up to prepare the way for the kings from the east. Then I saw three impure spirits that looked like frogs. They came out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. Remember the unholy trinity. They are demonic spirits that perform signs and they go out to the kings of the whole world to gather them for battle on the great day of God Almighty. Look, I come like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake and remains clothed so as not to go naked and be shamefully exposed. And they gathered the kings together to the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. The seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air and out of the temple came a loud voice from the throne saying, it is done. It's very similar, I mean, it's a similar image of Christ on the cross, right? It is finished. Then there came flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, and a severe earthquake. No earthquake like it has ever occurred since mankind has been on earth. So tremendous was the quake. If you look back, at the, the last of the seven seals and the last of the seven trumpets, there was also earthquakes, but this is the, the mother of all earthquakes. The great city split into three parts and the cities of the nations collapsed. God remembered Babylon the great and gave her the cup filled with the wine of the fury of his wrath. Every island fled away and the mountains could not be found. From the sky, huge hailstones, each weighing about a hundred pounds fell on people and they cursed God on account of the plague of hail because the plague was so terrible. <clears throat> and that is the end of God pouring out his wrath upon the earth. It gets down to, I mean, it gets down to some pretty, uh, is about as terrible as it could be. An image of the earth being scorched, of the waters being poisoned, of the of the climate being, I mean, it's, it's reminiscent of some of our, our biggest fears today that we often speak about in our, and I'm not saying this is happening today, it is not, but it, we can get behind these fears, right? The, the world plunged into darkness, that makes me think of uh, if, if we lost all electricity, all power, right? That would be the world, that we would consider that to be the world plunging into darkness, um, so on and so forth. Uh, and these are, again, these are symbolic images to keep in mind. These aren't 
you know, it, th these are images of things that are terrible and awful, but they're not literal in that sense. So we can, you know, we have a freedom to imagine what that might be like. Uh, just like these demonic spirits that, um, that cause kings and powers that be to do terrible things aren't really frogs, right? <laughs> these are they're not frogs hopping around out of people's mouths. These are just images that John is seeing and uh, about, uh, about what is happening here. Okay, so that, there's so much to be said about that that I'm, I'm, I'm freezing up again here. <laughs> the significance of that for our lives, and, and I, for, in my view, and as we get close to the end of the book of Revelation, I've said this before, um, and it really doesn't matter what my view is, as God is very clear about this, no one knows the day and the hour, and I'm included in that, and none of you know it, and I don't know it. In my view, I don't think this is going to happen soon. This is not something that's going to happen in my lifetime or probably in the next few generations. Um, but I also don't think it's going to be thousands of years from now. Uh, and I could be wrong. Uh, but that, that's just my view from what I'm seeing in the world and what I'm reading here. Um, the only thing in the book of Revelation that I have sort of uh, stated, again, as my opinion, I know, but the thing that the, the image of the, the dragon and the, the woman who was Israel being pursued and attempted to be killed and then um, seemed to me very much to be an image of the Holocaust. Uh, that just seems to me to be that way. Again, I could be wrong. That's not, it's not delineated clearly uh, in the Bible, but it just seems to be that way. And if that were the case, then scripture is very clear that after the Holocaust, Satan turns his, his view to the, the church, to those who follow Jesus to undo the church. And I do see that after that time period, uh, the church is starting to be undone. And everybody points fingers and has a, has a way to blame at whose fault it is that the church is being undone. And, uh, and I, I would encourage you not to play that game. It's nobody's fault. It's not, it's, this is the trajectory of history that the church will be undone and persecuted and shrink and, and almost made entirely extinct before the coming of the day of the Lord. And this should impact our attitude as Christians. Uh, and it should mean that we are not about taking over or winning because we can't win and we're not going to win. The only thing that we need to be worried about winning are winning souls for, for the Lord. And that is, that is a battle of the Holy Spirit. That is a battle of, of using the gifts of the Spirit and love and compassion, self-sacrifice, uh, you know, and, and, and putting on the armor of God and, and, you know, faith and righteousness and all these things. I mean, we, we know, if we know the Bible and we know what we're to do, we know what our marching orders are. And so we are not going to win any cultural battles in the long run. And, and I'm not saying that cultural battles don't matter, that, um, you know, we, we live in a world. And so we do things, we do things like vote. We do things like have an input into how our children go to school or all these sorts of things. And that's, that's well and good. But as Christians, we aren't going to win the battle, <laughs> whatever that battle might be. That's not the way of Christ right? The way of Christ is to lay down his life and to die. And the church is going to lay down its life and die too, as a whole. And therein we find victory. And that's good news for us, because it doesn't depend on our strength, doesn't depend on our willpower to win. And I, I find great comfort in that as a Christian, as a pastor, certainly, that I don't have to win. I just preach the, the gospel as best I know how. I treat people the way Jesus tells us to treat people as best I know how within the purview of my own sinful realm, I do the best I can. And, and that, that's, that's the totality of it. And that, that to me, that is the good news of these terrible, uh, these, and they are terrible, the terrible things to read and terrible things to contemplate, but just, just and true are your judgments, is the word that comes from the altar, just and true. I can depend on them. No one is suffering unjustly. No one is suffering something that they did not deserve. And what is more, they could have availed themselves of the grace of God, such that no matter what they deserved, if they simply bent the knee and said, Lord, you are God and I am not, then they would know peace. And that, and that is the, the core of the gospel. And so it's, you know, it's, 
difficult to read of these things in the sense because we, we just envision no human like most humans don't like to envision other humans suffering. <laughs> Um, and that is a good thing. And God wants you to be that way. And we're supposed to have compassion on everyone, regardless of, you know, it's like working in a homeless shelter or, or uh, you know, with the people who, whose lives have come apart in different ways. You know, it's not our job to go to them and say, what sins have you committed such that you are here that I can judge you for? It's not our job. And it's not helpful. And it, 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 it takes away from the, uh, the reality of your own sins. God help you if you had to suffer the full magnitude of, of, of your own sins. You would not survive that experience. So, uh, you know, th these are the things, um, th these are the reasons that this passages like this give me hope and joy as opposed to just, well, that was a terrible thing to read. I hope I never have to witness that. Um, and then finally, um, Jesus saying in the middle of this, look, I come like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake and remains clothed so as to not go naked and be shamefully exposed. And I am actually gonna read, I did print out a bit from Matthew 24, because it's, it is very, um, it, is, it is basically that, is that passage. So it's not on the screen up there, but this is Matthew 24 verses 36 through 51. About that day or hour, no one knows, as I said earlier, not even the angels in heaven, nor the son, but only the father. Um, in fact, you'll notice, actually, I don't know if I mentioned this earlier, but when Jesus, uh, when Jesus harvests the earth in that first image, when, he's, when uh, it's an angel who comes and tells Jesus, now's the time to harvest. Presumably the angel was told by God, God the Father. And he says, now's the time. Now Jesus li literally does not know the time when he's going to be told to harvest the earth. Uh, As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark. They knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them away. And that is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding with a handmill. One will be taken and the other left. This is, a, I take it to be a description of the resurrection. Therefore, keep watch because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into. So you also must be ready because the son of man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. And what I will say about that, and this works on two levels, and when we're in the book of Revelation, we might forget that this works on two levels. This works on the level of Christ coming back to the earth. We don't know when that'll happen. We don't know when the resurrection will happen and when these events will take place. We don't even necessarily know exactly what they will look like when they are taking place. But it also works on the level of your life on earth, the, the, the decades that you've been given here on this earth. You don't know when your last day on this earth will be. You know, I, maybe the older you get, you get more sensitive to this, but I, I feel like I'm getting more sensitive to it when I'm reading in the news. I read about someone who died in some freak accident or, or, you know, just had a very unusual event that took their life away, you know, in the prime of their life. And I think, boy, I just, you just don't know. You don't know. I mean, you don't know if this could be your last day on earth. And to me, that's a, you know, that sort of uh, like, that wakes me up. Like, this could be, you know, my last day. This could be your last day. And the older you get, the more those chances shrink, right? They're, you're you're, all, you're rolling the dice every day. I'm sorry, people. I don't mean to, <laughs> I'm not trying, but this is the reality, right? And so when people say, you know, um, to get right with God, because you don't know how much time you have, and Jean Rene has a whole song about this. I mean, it, there's, it, it should press into us. What if today was my last day? Where am I at with the Lord? And that doesn't mean, you know, our, are you perfect? Have you been made perfect? I mean, that'll build up a lot of anxiety within you. I know you haven't been made perfect, but are you right with the Lord? Do you trust him more than you trust anyone else? Have you given your life to him in such a way that no one else has your life in a way that the Lord has your life? Not your spouse, not your children, not your best friend, but the Lord has your life. Have you done that? And if not, then consider no one knows the day and the hour. He'll come like a thief. And you won't be expecting it. Amen.
that's the closest I get to hellfire and brimstone people. And it's, but it's, you know, it's, there's a, there's a power there. There's a reality there that we need to reflect on. I will pray and we will go to communion and then we will worship together. Lord Jesus, I do, I do yearn for your kingdom. I do wish it was here now. And Lord, as a people, as a community, we will not take the hands of history, take the reins of history and control it. You will. Lord, we trust you. We trust the workings uh, of, of everything that you're doing. Even the hard things in our lives, the things we don't understand, the hard things in the Bible that seem terrible to us, we trust you, Lord. We trust the work of your hands, the work of your judgment. And we thank you, Lord, for your love that undergirds and supersedes all judgment. We thank you for your love that is poured out into our hearts through your spirit, your love that brings forgiveness and mercy, not just once, but every day, all day. I pray, Lord, as we go to your table, that we would experience anew your love, your love and your grace and your suffering that saved us from these judgments. And so we worship you, Lord. And Lord, we say, haste the day when our faith shall become sight. Amen. And if you're in a relationship with Jesus, we do invite you to his tables.